Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Friday lunchtime lecture uh, with Dr. Petra Lincoln. Uh, my name is Dr. David Tarrant from the Open Data Institute, and it's my privilege to be introducing this one this week um, around un unlocking contaminated land data for new housing. Um, it's an area that's kind of close to my heart. I, I uh, live, uh, sorry about the background noise, by the way, the neighbors have got the builders in, but this is an area a little bit close to my heart as uh, when I bought this house that I'm currently living in, it was found out that there is an environmental site right opposite, um, which cannot be built on for various reasons that I was unclear about at the time, which I'm, I'm glad it can't be built upon, but that's good. So um, I'm, I'm very close to this and, and I'm looking forward to hearing about the outputs of what was uh, a project that was of part funded by um, ODI as well. Um, so Dr. Petra Lincoln is going to be running us through this and she's a hydrogeologist. I read that as well. Like many people are thinking, what's one of those? That sounds like an awesome job title. So perhaps Petra, you give us intro to what that job title entails. Yeah. So hydrogeologist, it's that job title has got the two words to it. So hydro, that means water, geologist, that's geology rocks. So that's about water flowing underground within the rocks, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Great. Excellent. <laughs> and you've got a few members of your team also on the call today. I believe you're going to introduce each of those, give them a chance to say hello. Um, so I'll let you do that. But uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Th thanks, Dave. Th thanks for introducing us. Um, yeah. So, so the, the exciting th thing about the project we've worked on is the fact that it's been a, a multidisciplinary, um, multidisciplinary collaboration between myself as, as, a, as a person we, working more within the um, geo-environmental space, but also um, with Paul and Darren who work um, in architecture and engineering. And yeah, do you want to talk more about yourself? Paul, go, go first. I'll go first then. Uh, yeah, so my name is Paul Bishop. <laughs> I am a data scientist within the architectural and master planning department of Atkins. So I also have a background in architecture. And I suppose at a certain point I got frustrated with traditional methods of architecture. So started a PhD in spatial analysis and sort of data science. And this sort of brought me into this sort of sector of being a data scientist within a group of architects. And this also gave me opportunity to collaborate with other departments within Atkins, which is Petra and Darren. Hi, uh, yeah, very similar for me, uh, but uh, my sort of domain expertise or background is in geotechnical engineering. Um, though I, I did my research in computational mechanics, so the actual numerical modeling um, deterministically of, of, of those processes in the ground, um, as sort of foundations, uh, uh, tunnels, uh, sort of subsurface flow, uh, and then kind of working in, in quite a sort of digital numerical uh, space. Um, it's, uh, I've been quite interested in kind of extending into um, sort of algorithms. Um, uh, and apply numerical methods um, uh, to optimize solutions uh, and also looking into data, data scientists and so, and so on and kind of opening up that area and that's been uh, great to explore that on, on this, this particular project. Um, so yeah, uh, over to Petra. Yeah, I, I think I'd say one of the things we've got in, in common is working with um, large data sets and um, yeah, I myself have mov moved into that space. Like, I guess similarly as Paul, I was getting frustrated with how much data I was dealing with and um, decided to do something about it and, and uh, learn to program and so on. So that's why I'm, I'm working in this space. Um, so yeah, I think we can uh, we can begin with the talk. Um, in general, you can find us on LinkedIn. Um, that's one of the things I wanted to point out. You can find us on LinkedIn and, and get in touch after the talk if you fancy. Um, so I'm going to crack on with the talk. Um, so um, the content of, of the talk is, is here. So uh, I'm going to start with a safety moment. That's something we always do at, at Atkins. Um, I'm then going to um, introduce the project's challenge statements, um, what we were looking at within the project. Uh, I'm going to talk about the connection between land contamination um, and data and how that's important. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, the project itself and how it addresses the challenge statements. So the sa safety moment is about remediation going not too well. Um, you might have seen a, a documentary on the BBC um, in April 
uh, it was about um, cause it, Corby poisoning, so you can look that up uh, online. But basically, it was a steelworks site that was being remediated, um, and industrial waste, including toxic waste, was being transported um, in lorries across the town um, that were open, and it, it resulted um, in toxic uh, dust being spread across the town. And this has resulted um, in babies being uh, born with limb defects. So you can see that you know the, the safety is very important in, in contaminated land. Uh, uh, but it's important to note that if we do the correct risk assessment for uh, land contamination and if we follow the appropriate procedures, things like this can be easily avoided. So um, that's, that's the important note to say. And I'm going to be talking about that risk assessment process during the talk. So why is data important when it comes to brownfield uh, redevelopment? We all know that there's a housing crisis in the country. Um, we've got some data saying that one point, about 1.1 million households in England are on the um, social housing waiting list. Um, and it's estimated that about a million homes can be built um, on brownfield sites. So uh, that's great news. Um, we want to uh, support the development on brownfield sites rather than on greenfield because that's, that's more sustainable. Uh, but the issue with that can be that you can have ungrown, unknown ground conditions on those sites and therefore there's potential for, for land being impacted by contamination. And this might be um, a bit easier for large developers to deal with. So if you've got a big site where you can build a lot of homes, um, then the cost of the remediation can be covered a lot um, easier than, for example, when you've got a smaller developer that tries to develop a, a smaller site. Uh, and then the cost of the remediation might have a, a greater impact um, on, on the profitability of those projects. Uh, and if we've got good access to data and open data, uh, we can then offer faster and cheaper assessments uh, for those sites. But also uh, what we looked into within this project was uh, the potential of gaining additional sin insights from large data sets. That's not really um, been done um, before. So the, the project challenge statements um, kind of cover what we've done during the project. Um, so um, the first one uh, was to uh, look into what data uh, we use and, and, and to catalogue it, um, that, the, the data that supports the understanding of whether brownfield land uh, has been impacted by contamination. We then used um, case studies to um, demonstrate how open and closed data of previously developed sites could reduce the ground condition uncertainty. And then we created a framework for encouraging um, data sharing uh, across the uh, brownfield development business. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, so what is contaminated land? Um, I've got a, a definition here, contaminated land generally um, refers to land that contains elevated concentrations of potentially hazardous substances. That's the definition that comes the, from the Syria and C552 uh, report. These contaminants can be um, present naturally, uh, but mo most likely it's um, a, a legacy of the, of the industrialization of, of Britain over the past 200 years. Um, I've got an, an example um, on the slide you can, you can see um, former gasworks sites. Um, there's a lot of gasworks sites at tr across um, Britain because we used to produce um, gas from coal. Um, and it's just an example. So um, previously, people didn't really care about the environment too much. There's been uh, spillages, leakages. There wasn't uh, appropriate legislation. But now we're looking after our environment a, a lot better. But it just means that we have to deal with that, um, that legacy of the past. Um, and uh, therefore, there's potential for an acceptable risk to be posed uh, by, by land contamination. So how do we do the risk assessment? Um, I'm just going to talk you um, a bit through that process. So you, you'll see how it works um, and how, how data relates to it. Um, so th this is a, a simple conceptual, simple conceptual model. Um, so we've got, let's say we've got an old gas work site where there was a, a gas holder. Um, and we've got some main ground, which is basically deposits that have been put there um, by humans. 
uh, and this is then underlain uh, by the, um, the strata underneath with, with groundwater and, and there's a river and let's say we're proposing that we're going to demolish that cast holder and put some houses on it. Um, so um, if we look at it, um, we can identify that our made ground and um, the gas holder um, are our sources um, of contamination um, because in the made ground, um, people used to put anything in there really um, that, that can be um, chemicals leaking from that and so on. Um, and then um, we've got a pathway then from, uh, from that source so, um, for example, that gas, gas holder might be leaking, there can be um, uh, pollutants um, being released from, from the made ground, but not only downwards towards the, the groundwater, uh, and then uh, they can be transported via the groundwater, but there can also be uh, vapors released into the houses, um, and we can have, for example, gardens on, on site, so uh, people might ingest the contaminants, get um, inhaled uh, dust and so on. So um, that's how those contaminants get, can get transported towards the receptors. So um, we also look at whether there's any receptors um, associated with that development over the site. So um, in this case, we could have the groundwater, the surface water as a receptor, then the, the humans and, and the properties um, on site. And what's really key about this is looking for the linkages. So if we've got source, pathway and receptor, then we've got a linkage and there could be an acceptable risk. If there's no pathway, there's no linkage, there's no, there's therefore no risk. But what, how data goes into it, all of this is described by data, so we collect data um, about the sites. Um, risk assessment um, is um, undertaken uh, according to uh, this guidance, which you, which you can find online, um, and it's undertaken in three stages. Um, so the first one is um, mainly desk-based, and uh, but also contains um, a, a walkover. Um, and if we find that there's an unacceptable risk, uh, then we undertake the next stage, uh, which is the ground investigation and then interpretation of, this, of that data. And if there's still an acceptable risk, uh, then we undertake a, a more detailed uh, risk assessment where we can do, for example, modeling of um, transports of, of contaminants in groundwater and do some um, site-specific assessments. And if there's still an unacceptable risk, then uh, remediation might need to be undertaken. So that's how the, the process works. So the, the first stage of the project was the, the data catalog. So we've created a, a data inventory. I appreciate that you might not be able to see uh, the details um, on your screens, um, but you can find um, that data inventory on GitHub. So there is a, a link, you can look at it. It's in, in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and what we've done, uh, we looked at the different stages of the risk assessment uh, process and uh, listed the data sets that are associated with that part of the process. And if you were to uh, look at that inventory, you would find that it's a mixture of open and closed data. So open data that's freely accessible and, and reusable um, and closed that's not that easily accessible and might be uh, purchased. Um, and these data sets, they come from a variety of sources and, and um, data owners. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, one of the data owners is the um, British Geological Survey. So they provide some of the data sets um, openly, but some of the, um, the data, more detailed data, uh, might need to be purchased. Um, there's other data owners like Coal Authority, Environment Agency, the local authorities own a lot of data um, as well, but also our clients who um, undertake the, the land, um, the, the site investigation, or we undertake the site investigation for them. Um, but it wouldn't be a presentation about uh, environmental data if I didn't mention um, Landmark and Groundshore, uh, who are companies uh, who provide access um, to um, lots of data sets that are key to our assessments and we, we tend to purchase data from them because then we've got access to both open and closed data um, and we, we get it all in one place, in one report or uh, in one, on one website. 
um, or um, NGIS. Um, and you will notice that there's a big mixture of formats. It can be in Excel, CSV, but also we've got geospatial data, as I mentioned, the, the GIS. Some of it is in PDFs, which makes it difficult to automate any processes. Um, we also look at um, historical maps um, that are not freely um, available. They're owned by Ordnance Survey. Um, and I need to mention the AGS data, um, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk about AGS data in more detail later on. Um, so we then did the comparison between the um, open and closed data. So we undertook two investigations. Um, one of them was a local case study when we looked at a former gas work site that's currently undergoing uh, redevelopment. Um, and we did a comparison between the outputs of the risk assessment uh, between the open source and closed data. And we also then uh, undertook um, an assessment on a, on a large data set, uh, which was um, interesting. So if we look at our case study um, for the like, local case study, we then can conclude that the data that describes the environmental co conditions, like the locations of rivers and the, the river quality, um, and some of the parameters about the, the geology and, um, and the groundwater, they tend to be open data. But if you want to um, get more data on, on geology and, and groundwater, for example, um, that's closed. So that can be um, owned by our clients who undertook the, um, we undertook the grant investigation for. Um, and especially the data on previous um, uh, site development, that's often closed um, in the historical maps. Uh, we can't uh, freely review. Um, and then some of the um, some of the data that describes um, the, the the pathways and the receptors uh, on, for the future development that's um, included in the design information. So, for example, there's going to be a difference if you're going to build houses with gardens on site, or uh, if you're going to have a commercial development that's all going to be covered in hard standing. So that's going to make a difference to to the assessment. AGS data. So here we are. Um, AGS data was created by the Association of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Specialists. Um, they're volunteers and they have uh, brought this um, great data format to us. Um, uh, the good thing about it is that it enables uh, rapid uh, data transfer between organisation, but it is a it is a transfer format. Um, at the moment, it's not um, an industrial data standard. Um, and it's in, in text files and, and it contains the um, tables on geotechnical and geoenvironmental data. Um, Atkins stores um, this data in the open ground database. Don't be mistaken, it's called open ground, uh, but it doesn't um, store open data and it's not a, an open source software. So it's a proprietary software. Um, and it enables data management um, project by project. And we're not the only consultants who are using this software. There's other consultancy companies and contractors who are using it. So it's quite a widespread um, piece of software within the industry. Um, but what we've done within this, this, this project um, is that we access the um, multi-project data uh, via the Open Ground API using Python. So we were then able to look at the large data set, uh, so multi-project data set. Um, and the code that does this is soon to be uh, released on GitHub. Um, important things to note about AGS data, it's a specialist data set um, created by specialists for specialists. Um, it's collected um, manually. You can have people on sites writing things in notebooks and then typing things up in the office. Um, in the better cases, um, they can write things up um, on a tablet. Um, as I said, things are managed project by project. Um, the guidance on, on creating the AGS data is not always uh, clear and updated. For example, the um, 
uh, data that are provided uh, by laboratories. Uh, the guidance been updated in 2011 and there are uh, bits uh, missing. Um, so therefore, uh, it's a bit open to interpretation how you should create that data. Um, people who generate those da data sets are not trained in data science. So sometimes they might not have the um, appreciation of, you know, the importance like of keeping things consistent and you know writing the, the numerical values in, in a special columns and not text and so on um, and it's important to write um, data management plans and standards for, for projects but all this uh, can then lead to difficulties when uh, analyzing uh, large data sets nevertheless we've done that uh, it has it had its limitations and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail on that um, but what we've done was that we compared the concentrations um, of two chemicals within the database um, to generic assessment criteria so um, generic assessment criteria that's um, simply said that's a concentration um, and if that um, chemical is present above that uh, value then further assessment might be um, required and needed and what we've done then we've then uh, anonymized that data um, uh, and and plotted that um, on the map um, so that this is um, the, the hex grid um, has got values um, that are sort of averaged if you like so um, let's say the greener it is the less number of exceedances for the generic assessment criteria and the, the sort of um, more yellowish it, it gets uh, there were more exceedances um, and then this, this image is just zoom in so um, the data is anonymized So we come to the framework um, so the, the framework um, attempts to um, address um, the issues that the industry is facing and um, find a way forward. So uh, one of the key things is the skills within the industry. So um, when you look at um, data science, um, a data scientist needs to have a combination of um, domain expertise skills, statistical skills and computer programming. Um, and the do domain in this case is quite complex. You'll have people with geology, hydrogeology background, chemistry, environmental science or, or civil engineering. So that's pretty complex. And often uh, we will also have um, statistical skills so that this part is, is covered. But you will find in the industry that it's fairly rare that um, we have computer programming skills. But I have myself made an effort and um, develop some of these skills so I can I can look into the data science. Um, so uh, what we would like to see is, is maybe more training at universities and support from the professional bodies like the Geological Society, CYWIM or ICE um, to promote um, the, the computer programming skills. At the same time though, um, if somebody is really good at statistics and a good programmer, they still need to learn about the domain to be able to interpret the data um, and run the analyses. So I've just had a quick Google and looked up what, what's out there. There's, for example, a master's course um, on data science that's focused on environmental analytics. Um, but yeah, there's, there's not many people in the industry who currently have that skill set. We would also like to um, standardize and more unify the AGS data set. Um, so um, at Atkins we have produced um, our specification of on how we would like to um, have the AGS data provided to us from the laboratories and we're in the process um, of discussing with this with the labs how um, whether they're going to be able to deliver on that but we will be publishing this and um, so if anybody wants to um, start using the same standards um, um, so we can um, unify uh, the way data is uh, is produced within the industry so that they can be um, they can start using that as well and then then it comes to opening up data so at the moment um, there's an initiative called dig to share uh, which is which was created by the british geological survey um, and um, 
that asks people to submit their grant investigation data, but we would like to promote this, uh, this further um, uh, within the industry um, and also um, support people in submitting their uh, geo-environmental data. We know that there could be barriers um, uh, with you know, when, when, when it comes to data sharing uh, on concentrations of, of uh, pollutants in the ground. Uh, for example, landowners might be concerned about land prices and, and liability, uh, but we would like to open that discussion with all the, all the stakeholders in the industry um, and start supporting this uh, a bit more. Uh, and one example we, we've uh, found is the GeoTracker uh, database in California. I believe it's a legal requirement to um, submit the data um, to that um, database. Um, and it, it tracks the, the groundwater quality um, across California. And I have seen some papers being published that, uh, for example, can compare the, the efficiency of remediation of, of benzene across multiple sites, depending on what techniques have been used and so on. So I think it offers a great insight into, into the uh, land and, and groundwater contamination. And then we would like to propose a research project into anonymizing data sets. So when you, for example, look at um, Office for National Statistics um, uh, data on incomes, household incomes, you're not going to uh, find how much petrol Lincoln's earning, uh, but you might be able to uh, find data on how much people in, in my village um, are earning on average. So um, that's something we would like to uh, see created because it might break that barrier to um, opening up data. Um, so on the, on the figure, you can see our proposal, how uh, this could look like. You could, for example, have a, a hex grid uh, that would um, kind of estimate the risk of, um, of land being um, impacted by contamination. Um, and this would have to be researched, so we would have to study uh, what data sets would uh, feed into this information, uh, what are the statistical uncertainties and so, and so on associated with that. Um, but we, we believe this would be a, a great asset and it would be a great first high level kind of indication what uh, potential there is uh, for land contamination. It wouldn't replace the risk assessment process because that would have to always be um, undertaken, but it's, it's this first high level um, assessment um, that could be there. And it would not only be beneficial for housing, but it could be, for example, great for large schemes like railways and roads and so on, um, which are usually designed um, considering all the engineering constraints, but the contaminated land um, part of that, that's always the, the thing that's then done afterwards. But if you had a data set like this, you could, for example, avoid areas which might be um, at greater risk of being um, impacted by um, land contamination. And our framework feeds nicely into the geospatial strategy um, that's been published by the Geospatial Commission uh, of the government. Um, that's been done, I believe, in the past two weeks. Um, and you, you can see that we have um, we are promoting um, the, the use of location data because that's uh, that's we need to relate um, data to our uh, sites. Um, we would like to improve the access and open up more data. We're also proposing to enhance skills in the industry and we already have started enabling innovation um, in, the, in the business by unlocking a, a large data set. And you can see on the, on the figure on the right that the government's also looking at the underground data and the underground services. So that's how our project fits in with this. And that's the end of my talk. Great, thank you so much, Petra. Thank you very much. Um, so if anyone has got any questions, we obviously have the chat window where you can put them in. Um, you can also, if you want to, while, while someone else is speaking, you could, there's a raise hand button in Zoom. Um, so I'd appreciate that so that we can make sure that people, if you've got a question, you can raise your hand immediately, etc. cetera. Um, so while we're just waiting for people to think on that, thank you, Petra. I'll start you off with a question, actually, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about a number of other organizations who hold data or you purchase from them, and there's a lot of closed data in the arena. You mentioned 
one reason in there I think I put picked up on like the fear of being found out you know the fear yes. of this data you know leading to people being found out that there's a contaminant somewhere what, what do you think the other fears are around opening up more barriers to opening up data are in this in this I guess one of the fears is the misinterpretation of it because you might think like oh there's a, an increased concentration of this and that there. That's really dangerous. But actually, if you were to then do the assessment, then the impact of that is not that great. So, so I think that's that's one of the barriers. And yeah. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, I often find that fear of misinterpretation, misrepresentation. It's a, an, an amazing one with uh, with lots of data that you find out that, as you say, with your data science, the Venn diagram. You know, you find out that people could misrepresent it, but uh, having that expertise is a difficult thing to combine with all the skills that you need in the air. Mm -hmm. And I really like the way you, you talked about that. And uh, it's certainly something we've been uh, looking at in the ODI. Um, uh, let's see, did anyone have a question? Anyone got one in chat? We'll put it up to four. Feel free if you want to unmute yourself at this point, if anyone's got a, a burning question. We also have Petra's colleagues, remember, on the call. So if anything we want to quiz. Petra, it's Jason. Hi, Jason. Oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah, Thanks yeah. Very interesting. Um, I've been in the industry long enough now, sadly, to have seen sites investigated numerous times. I've, as well as a consultant, I've been a regulator and so on. So I've seen reports on sites that might have been investigated four or five times. And I think one of the um, barriers that I see um, is the fact that consultants aren't happy, able, or willing to take on previous consultants' um, assessments of data. Mm. That might be because of insurance purposes. I'm worried about negligence and so on. But I think there's also, as a still as a reasonably immature industry, there's still a case of one-upmanship, and it's still very common with the consultancy sector, obviously not at Atkins, but elsewhere for people to try and find holes in other people's data, not to prove a scientific fact, but just to try to show to their client they're that little bit better than them. <laughs> and I know it's probably maybe sort of out with of, of the strict data appraisals that you've been thinking about, but have you, have you had any thoughts about that? And, and you know, do, do you see, I guess, other industries taking a different view of how they manage the data and how they share it rather than the very, in the long term, very unsustainable way of people going off and investigating the same site more than once? Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a really good point. And I think if we had that data more uh, aggregated in the same place um, and, you know, it, it'd be dated so you actually can tell, you know, when the investigation was undertaken, uh, when the samples were taken, and then also the details of any remediation uh, that was undertaken for the site. And it, if that was aggregated, then I guess you could avoid this whole, like, I'm going to investigate that again. Um, because often, as I guess, as we know, that the um, bolt holes will will have um, uh, been decommissioned, so you can't, for example, undertake the, the groundwater monitoring. So you'd have to install the wells again, and so on. So, does that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I'm probably, well, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, to the converted <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, you're a strong ally in myself for everything you're doing. Um, I think maybe part of, of it lands in the um, lap to the landowner. You know, we, we see some of our clients, have, as I said, have had sites investigated lots of times, and maybe there, there comes a point where they need to appoint an in, a separate consultant to go for all this data and say, this is good data, that can yeah. now be um, yeah. got rid of uh, when they're appointing a consultant to actually do some work they can say our client is happy for you to rely on this data it's just mm. um, as I say I think it's a, a combination of legal aspects and, um, and of one-upmanship but that's just interesting for your thoughts thank you yeah and i think well if the data was actually in ags and we didn't have to read over all these reports which we then often have to digitize and and that that that's such a painful process and, and it's so time consuming um i think it'd be it'd be a joy to do that to look at the old data sets yeah God, i absolutely couldn't agree more on that they've been plowed <laughs> across things that have been scanned in and, and you yes. can't tell whether it's a smudgy marker or a decimal place it's uh no yes. oh. that entirely thank you <laughs> on that note steve thought as also written in, in chat and uh, I mentioned about AGS which provides an access point to store all this data concisely so how do we start to get this open for example uh, it has lots of data but it's held in PDFs yeah so, so I guess 
like we'd have to make a make a conscious effort to digitize some of our old data i know that um the the bgs has got a lot of data and then if you look at, at the bgs website there's a lot of logs for example um that have been done over a hundred years or so or so and and um yeah the the data's there but it's just not digitized so yeah we'd have to somehow undertake that process i guess I'm, I'm so on a funny note, after, I, I thought there might have been a typo in that, but I've just realised there's an AGS and a BGS. Is there a CGS coming? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, just on the previous point, it also sounded to me as if there's this one-upmanship that Jason was talking about, perhaps there's a, there's a feeling of everything belongs to somebody who doesn't want to let go of it. But the th we need to think more in a, in a joined-up sort of way that this is our mm. data, as in everyone's collectively. Maybe there's a lack of trust in there potentially that needs to also be addressed. I would like to see it to be a legal requirement to having, having to submit that data, but that's my personal view. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else uh, would agree to that. Paul, do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, coming from my sort of background, it's actually been really interesting to be in this project because, you know, my sort of background has always been sort of above ground data, sort of looking specifically at housing, looking at sort of spatial analysis and looking at things above and, you know, looking into the sort of below ground data, as I keep on calling it. I think it's actually fascinating to see where it is at the at the time, and you know just to see where it needs to get to to start to be interpreted interpreted at a larger scale and be able to analyse alongside a lot of other data. I think it's it's really fascinating because you know I'm very used to using data which is easily accessed through APIs or like TFL data, which is a great example of open data, and being able to quickly go into that and get good analysis and start to think about how you can sort of start to monetize that. But when it came to sort of contaminated land data, you know, my mind was blown when I started to look at these data sets and just like seeing, like, first of all, seeing lots of potential and getting excited, but then being disappointed because I couldn't actually interpret it. And it was really sort of really frustrating on my side. But then it starts to sort of open up the actual collaboration and understanding the necessity for domain experts to start to open up this data and release it. And it's, it really does start to make you think, you know, how does this actually fit in with all the other sort of data sets and you know, this geospatial strategy where they start to try to overlay all the various different sorts of data. You know, it becomes very obvious that contamination has to be part of that discussion. And it is incredibly important when we start to think about unlocking brownfield sites, as it's something which developers are consistently asking us about. So I think you know this is really fascinating in that sort of sense and that you know the sort of the journey that I went through with this AGS data was really sort of interesting. Steve's back in chat saying is he's trying to get the geology blogs digitized so maybe a next step for this data um, I think I, I'm, I'm gonna the, the next step might be you know the the openness and the sharing maybe more of that I'm not sure if that's what you meant but I'm hoping that that's a you know a collective effort to get things digitized and out there so that others can you know after digitization I've done a lot of that in the past you know there's a lot of digitization and then there's obviously quality checking alignment with mm. new standards all this stuff you were just talking about to make sure it's useful to those people who need it um, Rebecca also mentioned about digitizing borehole logs which sounds amazing as part of her MSC. Um, mm -hmm. That's literally digging a hole in your MSC almost. Um, so that ties in. Um, uh, and Michael Turner says he's developed uh, an automated BH digitizer for the geological geotechnical data. It'd be nice to extend that to contamination data with the right funding uh, possibly. So the, it, there seems to be a lot of activity around digitization at the moment. Was that a question? <laughs> oh, I, I was I was kind of like, it, it wasn't, I didn't get there quite, um, but there does seem to be a lot of activity there. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's quite a lot of interest in projects and digitalizing like text, so you think like what the British Library and Google and Microsoft are doing at the moment, so mm -hmm. digitalizing a lot of books and you, you can start to think about so much information which is documented, especially within the built environment, you think like the process of a planning application, yeah. and the amount of documents that people submit in PDF format and the, the information that you could mm. career from that would be absolutely amazing. But yeah. with it being PDF and JPEG, it's, it's not really that easy to sort of interpret. Yeah, if, if there were geospatial data sets on, you know, site boundaries and, and uh, then the AGS data associated with the site investigation, I think that would be a lot more, um, a lot more useful um, than the PDFs. 
So uh, a question from Matt White. Um, contaminated land is closely linked with our built environment. Um, are the Centre for Digital Built Britain involved? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Does anybody know any, the answer? Uh, they probably should be involved if we're talking about a, a digital trend here. I think it's something which clearly has to be incorporated into any sort of future digital trend. I probably don't know the sector well enough to know if it's actually incorporated into the CDPB, but hopefully there is someone that would know that. Awesome. Thank you for the question, Matt. Uh, so quickly back to me then. So, so what's next, do you think? What's next? Yeah, what's next? You mentioned about the anonymization project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think, well, next should be our framework. I would really like to, I, th I think the, the research into the anonymized data set uh, sounds very exciting to me. Um, I'd like to see uh, maybe a PhD done on this. Um, so we might need to look into, you know, where to get the funding for this and, um, and then, yeah, get, get somebody who's keen to do that. And I think the, the interesting thing would be to, to select the right person. Do we want to get somebody who's really good at data science, but they would have to learn more about um, land contamination? That'd be interesting. Darren, did you want to add anything? Yes, uh, um, so uh, it's worth appreciating um, the, the, uh, the GEO Index. Uh, there's a Dig to Share initiative, and there's a few individuals on, on the talk that have listened, um, and that's all starting to open up AGS data. Uh, and we'd like to kind of um, make, uh, build that into our, our framework. Um, the issue being uh, further standardization um, so, so we can access that, that, that data um, in, in an aggregated sense. Um, and as, as Petra was saying as well, uh, it's certainly uh, the need for more research in how we can kind of um, aggregate this data or abstract it at a higher level to kind of add value and uh, to keep all parties um, happy and kind of in consensus. Um, uh, that, that, that might my main points. Um, and certainly from my perspective, having more um, uh, a kind of programming, doing the kind of uh, technological or software development behind, behind the project uh, and hopefully distributing that code in, in GitHub as well. People can see the kind of nuts and bolts of how in our industry we're able to access or not access data and, uh, and, and so on and may, maybe that code can kind of be useful as well. So we're happy to collaborate in that space as well from a kind of developer's perspective. Great, awesome. Um, yeah, I, I was interested when you said about the, the building in of the, the knowledge into different disciplines, um, mentioning about, you know, data science for in the, the building the, for the environment. Um, I, th I think there's, I'm the senior learning lead at the ODI. So I think there's also a, an opportunity to go the other way around and say to those who teach environmental science already, it's like, how do we get yeah. more of the data side into that so that they're more confident with, you know, this as being one of the key resources these days. Um, I don't know if that's something you've come across with any initiatives in that direction. Yeah, well, I've not I've not seen any any particular initiatives, but I think it'd be interesting to start that conversation with the professional bodies um, and uh, with the universities and and start talking to them and say, hey, have you considered um, getting a programming module into the environmental science course, for example, um, and you know highlight how important the data is and. Um, uh, I'm just trying to work out if this is a question from Chris. Uh, no, uh, well, is it just a point to the Lloyd's Register Safety Accelerators funded a startup uh, working with HSE to anonymize data at scale? Uh, perhaps that could help. So there's a link in the chat to that if anyone hasn't come across it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions from anybody? I'm just looking to see whether there's any raised hands. No, I don't think so. Give people a couple of moments just in case anyone's typing. I don't like to cut them off right at the end. But if there isn't, I'd like to say thank you to everyone today. Thank you to Petra and, and all the colleagues uh, for this excellent talk. Really good to hear about the project. And, and I'd look forward to, to seeing what's going to happen next and, and the next steps. And I, and I wish you all the best with it. So uh, if there's no other questions, I'll end the recording there. Excellent.